like a pretty, um, pretty non-event. It's not noon yet. It's like there's more people here taking pictures than anything. here. I did see a media truck. Right there. There's some media. Looks like some people are either coming now or they're just getting out of court. Something's going on. It's lunchtime, I guess. Maybe that's what's going on. It's a really beautiful day.
they're leaving. Bad alarm. So, unless some more people show up, and a lot of them soon, it's not going to be much of an event. It's too bad. Although maybe a lot of people don't know about it. How you been? I'm good, you alright? Hey man, I'm good. You guys alright? We will keep it peaceful. There's a group of Teamsters down there. I'm not sure what time it is. Local 507. Well, that would be very cool if some union people finally came down here. I can even me. Yeah. And, and that's them. Being so close to cl oh, there's Frank Giglio. How you doing, baby? Pretty good. How you doing? I'm watching the protests that didn't happen. <laughs> what time did this start? Noon. What time is it? Uh, I don't, is it noon yet? I think I think it's pretty close. Uh, I heard the media already saying that they're leaving, so. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's time to do something else and stay in the room. Yeah. <clears throat> They tied up three police cars in the middle. <laughs> Chase me around and stuff. Ohio <laughs> bought a new house in his new district a month before that they published the. Uh, Collective voice 
against the economic corruption that envelops this country like the spidering legs of a rogue cancer. Look around at your countrymen and women. Many of you know not precisely what now stifles and travails that which was once the greatest economy in the world. But even though you may lack a clearly defined understanding, you feel it. You feel the pain of it. You feel the added stress. You look towards your brethren and you see their struggles and you sense, you sense a force greater than ourselves that serves to choke us out of prosperity and fairness, to strangle and smother us and stamp us out of the economic running so that the wealth of this nation may be reserved for the very few while the many are left to their daily toils and labors like hamsters on a never-ending wheel. You sense these unseen hands correctly, and now we must bind them. Bind them and drown the entity to which they belong. The economic travesty of today has been sufficiently defined by leading economists. Leading economist Robert Reich, Chancellor Professor of Public Policy at the University of California in Berkeley, and former Secretary of Labor under President Clinton, has displayed for us that the economic travails of today are primarily a function of concentration, debt, and speculation. Of these three concepts, I shall now give a clearly defined description. Concentration. As of 2007, 20% of the country owns 85% of its wealth. This 80% of the country is left to share in 15%. This is hardly equitable in a civilized society. It harkens back to the days of England where the lords and nobles controlled and concentrated, hoarded even the wealth of their country, leaving their countrymen and women, their labor class, to starve in an unforgiving poverty. With a disparity in wealth concentration so incredibly wide, the complete and total devastation, evisceration of the middle class is not only possible, but happening, happening today as we stand here breathing. I've no doubt that if the wealthy could obtain 85% of the oxygen in the air, they would opt to do that as well, turning their metaphorical choking of the middle class into a literal choking. Their exceptional greed and avarice is outlined by these statistics and others, statistics such as the following. The Economic Policy Institute has announced that between 1974 and 2008, the growth of average hourly compensation compared to productivity in America shows that our collective productivity has close to doubled while our collective compensation has stayed relatively unchanged. We are now putting in twice the labor, yet receiving zero increase in compensation. Comparing, to, comparing today's economy to that of the early 70s, such a dramatic shift must be considered criminal in the absence of nuclear war. This is no longer a country of laboring efforts and corresponding success. It is becoming more a casino, where the dice is always loaded and the house always wins. You take out the school loans, you take out a private bank loan, you start your business, you work twice as hard as our 70s counterparts, and this gamble, which would have long ago been considered a noble sacrifice, now inevitably results in a grand loss, forced by the unseen hand of the upper echelon, the plutocrats, who hoard wealth in stockpiles, investing only in foreign markets, and flushing the excess down speculative toilets, toilets like mortgage-backed securities. You ask why? Why does your business fail? Maybe you were simply a bad businessman or had bad luck. Right. Bad luck. However, this is wrong. Because the small business loan will help the business open its doors create a plentiful supply of the products or services it sells. But when the middle class lacks enough purchasing power to purchase these goods, there is a corresponding absence of demand. It is this absence of demand. It is this absence of demand which causes the doors of small business to close. It is the hoarding and concentration of 85% of the country's collective wealth held by the hands of the arist aristocratic minority that eviscerates the middle class purchasing power. In turn, this evisceration of purchasing power destroys middle class demand for middle class products and services. If there is no demand, there is no need for supply. If there is no need for supply, there is no need for suppliers. It is not complicated. If the middle class cannot afford to purchase the products it produces because they do not 
large share in a majority of the country's wealth, then they simply will not purchase those products. Demand goes down, businesses go down, stocks go down, morale goes down. And the few champions of this current plutocracy are the giant corporations like McDonald's and Walmart who hire their employees at pennies on the dollar because there exist no competing entities. They have created a new subclass in America, the everlasting impoverished, the indentured servants who serve your burgers and check out your groceries, the people who are chained by the products they sell, capable of affording none else, forcibly help feed the monster corporations by becoming, in turn, some of their greatest consumers. Consumers consuming the cholesterol-filled garbage who then sluggishly shuffle along. an investment made by, commonly, investment banks and investors seeking quick profits and high returns from questionable sources. The financial crisis of 2008, for instance, was caused by the creation of a speculative bubble. Investors reasoned that real estate always makes money because real estate always climbs in value. For a while, this reasoning was warranted, as more and more individuals with the financial means of doing so sought to purchase loans or homes. The problem began when the banks started lending to persons who could not pay their home mortgages and so should never have been granted the loans. The investment banks packaged these mortgages into mortgage-backed securities and sold them like hotcakes to investors the world over who made rivers of money off them. But when the mortgages stopped being paid by the poor homeowners, the houses foreclosed, the home prices fell, the values of the securities tanked, investors lost money, the banks hemorrhaged, the rivers dried. In comes the taxpayer Superman, and the rest is history. The problem is, had there been government oversight ensuring that these banks could not practice such negligent and arguably fraudulent loan practices, this whole problem would have never occurred in the first place. But while the house of cards crumbled, the Fed slept or was paid to sleep. In either case, the short-term investors and banking executives who made billions off of the prosperity of these speculative investments before it bursted, the ones who made their money and then got the hell out of Dodge because they knew what was coming are no less criminals than the common street thug who holds a clock to the head of the elderly to extort short-term cash. Amen. The Fed dropped the ball. Whether they were paid off to do it or not is debatable, but what is not debatable is that the federal government paved the way to hell in gold. Gold man sacks. Aside from failing to enact legislation to curb speculative investments, the Fed made their gravest error some years ago in repealing the Glass-Steagall Act, which had been originally enacted to keep investment banks and commercial banks segregated. Had Glass-Steagall not been repealed, the financial markets would have suffered from the 2008 crisis, but they would not have drowned. The speculative investors would have taken grave personal losses, but the American investment banks and insurers, like Lehman and AIG, which serve to secure the money of average citizens, help grow their pension plans, and bolster public funding of local governments, would have been left largely unfazed. As a result of merging investment banks with commercial banks, when investment banks make speculative investments now, they are doing so with the general public's money. They are taking Grandpa's retirement plan and placing it on the international roulette wheel of whatever happens to be the hot speculative investment of that moment. Before it was mortgages. Next it might be Tanzanian plants or dwindling oil deposits. Any number of foolish speculations. The next facet of American foil I wish to address is that of personal debt. Household and personal debt has skyrocketed since the 1980s when productivity shot sky high and wage compensation stayed quite the same. When the middle class began to see the upper class siphoning the majority of America's wealth into private accounts, hedge funds, and other sanctuaries, the modern day treasure chests lost at sea where the proletariat may never hope to find them, 
The common people took to several coping mechanisms in order to hold on to a fair quality of life. The Declaration of Independence proclaims every man has a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But how happy can a country of great economic prosperity and wealth remain when the fruits of such prosperity are hoarded by the 1% at the top? So in order to keep their standing of living at a level that would allow for a smile in return for a day's labor, Americans began signing up for credit cards and taking out home equity loans in droves. The rising prices of homes always ensured that a middle class family hoping to have a little monetary cushion could refinance their home and borrow short term cash to float their families. However, when home prices tanked, the home equity loans tanked. No longer will this coping mechanism be available to middle America. Another coping mechanism, credit cards, have also seen the height of their efficacy in large part. People have borrowed the maximum amount of credit, many even having to enter bankruptcy as a result of the inability to handle the exorbitant interest rates charged. It is easy to point the finger at the middle class and wave it in shame that they should have never taken on such debt if they knew they could not pay it back. However, therein lies the problem. When the economic forecast was rosy, the people of this nation had every reason to believe they could pay it back. It wasn't until the rug was pulled out from under them that they fell into a despair of spiraling debt. They still got up to put on their slacks and their blues, their coats and their car hearts. They still wore a tool belt and went to work like every morning prior. But when the bottom fell out due to circumstances entirely out of their control, they were left holding the tool belt and the bag, the empty bag, to stand empty pocketed in unemployment lines. Woo! Aside from taking on massive debt, Americans coped by working more hours. Where a 40 hour work week was once the norm just 20 some years ago, more and more Americans have found themselves working 60 hours a week, sometimes multiple jobs, with varying shifts throughout the same day. The graveyard shift is truly grave when the day shift has siphoned off your spirits. But breaking their backs, Americans have trudged forward in hopes of aspiring to obtain what we used to call the American dream. Peace of mind through prosperity and success, economic stability and quality of life. The last coping mechanism for the country was to send its women to work. And women began sending themselves to work. Where before a single man earned a good enough wage, benefits package, and retirement pension to provide for his family, now a husband and wife, both working, both taking on personal and household debt, and both working more hours than ever before, is not enough to sustain a quality of life. Our countrymen and women have done everything within their power to adapt to the dire circumstances. They fought tooth and nail to claw their way into a life that their children might view as enticing. To pass on to their children the lesson of labor, that hard work will lead to a good life. But where before we saw proud laborers toiling away, we now see only ghosts and shadows, the dark circles under the eyes, the third cup of coffee, and the cigarette break. These are the defining moments of 85% of the people's lives. These are the vacant machines we see turning the cogs of this country. The over-caffeinated, underpaid hamsters on a never-ending wheel. All right, the last issue I wish to discuss is the abhorrent affirmation of the greatest corruption our country faces, the temperature of treachery that is the Supreme Court's holding in Citizens United. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Yeah. In Citizens United, the court issued a ruling that now allows corporations to throw limitless funding at politicians and their campaigns. This is the most dangerous paradigm shift of them all. It is no secret that politicians are continually wined and dined by the corporate lobbyists who serve to provide quid pro quos. For too long a time, lobbyists 
have been indirectly governing this country by soliciting votes from politicians in return for funding their political campaigns. What's the, diff what's the difference as to who is voting on a bill when you've got Senator Doe from Chicago? Bought and paid for by Big Tobacco, by McDonald's, by Aetna, by AIG, by Exxon. When Senator Doe blocks efforts at legislation aimed at limiting the cardio-killing sandwiches or the life-choking carbon emissions of Exxon and its subsidiaries, it's not Senator Doe, it's McDonald's and Exxon's pulling the strings, making these decisions. Yeah. Our senators and congressmen today are mere patsies. Washington is not broken, it runs very smoothly and efficiently because those who are running it include multi-billion dollar corporations concerned only with the bottom line of profit and not with the health or welfare of the people. We faced an uphill battle before, but after Citizens United we are left to climb a veritable vertical concrete wall with only our bare hands. A great majority of the points I have brought up to you today are illustrated in Robert Reich's book, Aftershock. Aftershock. Another great, treat uh, another great treatise on our current debate is Matt Taibbi's book, Griftopia. Go read these tonight. Learn yourselves of these problems and fight the ignorance that stands to repudiate these messages. Though we face the unprecedented forays of globalized economics and labor-replacing technologies, these things alone do not serve to sever the 99% from the gold-plated the gold-plated kings and the jewel-studded queens of demagoguery that comprise the 1%. The 1% that touts the efficacy of supply-side economics, whereby eliminating their tax burdens, they proclaim to bring jobs back to their domestic homelands. This is this is anachronistic logic and a dangerous illusion. In truth, there is no evidence to support that tax breaks to the rich would bring jobs back home. There is, there is, however, evidence to support that more money in the hands of the rich will instead lead to more outsourcing, hiring of cheap foreign labor, foreign headquartering, and more speculative investments. It is high time to expose these insidious lies, this doublespeak, the tax breaks on the rich somehow imposes prosperity on the people. We have the policemen. We have the teachers, the firefighters, all public servants. We have the doctors and the lawyers. We've got the construction workers, the mechanics. We have the people without whom this country could not run. And it is time they take back their fair share and provide solely unto themselves and begin an upstream joke out on the rich. Yeah, Paul Kelly, K E L L U B. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I'm here today. I also want to welcome everyone to the General Assembly in Cleveland, Ohio, in solidarity with the Alright, so guys, this is how the gym. 
We got a few more people. There might be a couple of hundred people here now. Everybody's here can take the music to finish it with. So I'll be working more than that. But uh, again, it's probably the easiest to find out. Brian, I see what you're The agenda is one of the great ones that's the truth. Oh, yeah. So, when we have the closing, we'll be able to see the rest of the class. Sure. Oh. Yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? How's everybody feeling? Good! Good! One of the beautiful things about this movement is that everybody has a voice. But it's very important that when, when something is, is, is happening, when someone is speaking, that people are paying attention and people are responding. Democracy is not a one-way street. Democracy is not a one-way street. I just want to go over a few things so that everyone can be involved in this process. This is participatory democracy. This is exactly what our country is supposed to be all about. Yeah. If you hear something that you agree with, put a thumbs up. Big thumbs up. Is everyone okay with this? There we go. If there's something... Okay, I'm, that I'm you don't heading out. That you necessarily identify with, that you don't agree with, put a big thumbs down. We don't like big things. What time is it? Of us, all right? Thank you. Yeah, I'm leaving. If there's, some, there's somebody ready to camp out here. They're late. This is not a top down movement. Okay? So I want to make sure that everyone understands that that's the process that we're going to be following. It's like the rope on top. Okay, there's two more things. I want everyone to just pay attention. We have a procedure we're following. It's not parliamentary, it's not a corporate boardroom, but in order for any popular movement to have some success, there needs to be organization, am I right? Yes. Okay. So we're gonna have Jacob demonstrate. If there is, uh, as we're as we're speaking, if we're getting off topic, just hold up a triangle with your hand. Do some work. It's called the point of process. You have, you have to keep things organized. This guy claims he didn't want to be in camera. Keep walking in front of the camera. Are you? If you're confused. Uh, I don't know how, let me, uh, I'm confused. Kind of if, we, if we make an announcement, let's like say, you know, we just heard 30 people got left in our room. The media is starting to interview media, people now. There's actually 35 people arrested, there's 50 people arrested. You, you don't think you're up in the air, there's more point of information. Point of information, do you understand that? Woo! Of course. And you have the family. My butt is wet from sitting on the grass. I talk. And then, okay, so here's where consensus comes to you. If somebody disagrees so strongly, Okay, enough. Bye.